from recording on this computer. Hopefully I won't run out of space. Okay, everybody, uh, my name is Emmanuel. I'd like to introduce tonight uh, in our presentation, um, Dr. Anne McDonald, who has a number of clinics around Ireland and uh, she is uh, looking at talking about uh, the epidemiology studies as well as a bit about the coronavirus tonight um, with our special guest from Australia. And she will introduce who that is, as well as the accountant, an accountant there in, in Eamon in uh, Ireland. So Anne um, is considering launching some of our services in Ireland and around the UK. So, and she will explain in, uh, in detail, in time, what we do. Um, but in essence, we do have a platform that helps with video consultations and communications with your patients, especially in this day and age now, and in the, amongst the uh, issue of the coronavirus, these technologies that we do have a great um, communica communication platforms that really enhance that relationship with the patient while they're at, at a distance away from the practice. So, and I'd like you to take over and, uh, and it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Emmanuel, and, it, uh, and thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, I've been uh, in contact with Emmanuel for, um, for over a year and, and I've been looking at, he's got a superb system, uh, my practice, and um, he's got a great Facebook group, Dental Evolution, which I would recommend everybody uh, joins. It's a Facebook group. Um, and on St. Patrick's Day, he had a Facebook Live with Professor Laurie Walsh, who is professor in Brisbane. Um, and uh, Professor Walsh is a dentist and also an infection control specialist. Uh, probably one of the best presentations I've seen on coronavirus. And, and, um, I, and obviously things have moved on anyway since then. Uh, we've all gone into lockdown and um, I said, asked Emmanuel, was there a possibility that we could actually get Professor Walsh to give um, another, another lecture uh, with, you know, go back over the, what, he'd, what he'd said um, in the previous one um, and then also update us and tell us, you know, how we can set up our emergency hubs, how we can keep contact with our patients and how are we going to move out of this. Um, and then we also brought along uh, Eamon Corrigan. Eamon is an accountant based in Northern Ireland, so he is familiar with both UK uh, law and our, our accounting and Irish. Uh, and he specialises in dental uh, practices. Uh, he's got some really good um, strategies how to get your practice um, when it is actually working. But now that we're all obviously um, closed up and Eamon has some suggestions as well and he's got a really good PDF that we can make available with, with lots of information. So uh, I think maybe now it's time for Professor Walsh. Um, can you, uh, would you like to, to start? Yes, thanks very much Anne and uh, welcome ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what I see looking at the numbers in Ireland and how I think it's going to go. So I'm going to begin by just swapping screens to that. There we go. And what you can see here is, I'll zoom it up, there we go, is this presentation which is really going to focus on what I think is currently happening in Ireland and what that means for healthcare workers. So the last data from Ireland that was available this morning reported 506 cases who were healthcare workers. So clearly there is a significant component of the existing cases who are healthcare workers. And that's why I think it's a good thing that dentistry has gone into this more or less partial closure situation. If you start to analyze the data which the Irish government provides on their website, there's a couple of really interesting things. And you've probably seen many of these on your local news, but one of them is that the distribution is quite uneven. So there's a large number of cases in Dublin and, and in Cork. And if you look at the trend on daily new cases, over recent times, that's taken a bit of a dive, which is actually hopefully the sign of something which is very good to come. But if you just take the total number of cases and look at them as a cumulative figure, you do see a very, very strong exponential growth over a period of time. And because there is a lot of community transmission happening in Ireland at the moment, roughly 51% of cases use that mode of transmission. 
it's likely that this curve is going to continue to grow for some period of time. If you look at this in terms of the rate per million, the total number of cases has actually become quite evenly spread in terms of a ratio, which means the disease is penetrating fairly well across different parts of Ireland. But what is different is that the number of deaths is surprisingly large for the number of cases. So if you can compare it to Australia, which has just under 4,000 cases with 16 deaths, Ireland is running at 2,600 and odd and 46 deaths. There's a couple of things that could be happening. And one of them is that the community-based mode of transmission might be causing a different outcome of disease, or in fact, the viral strains may be quite different. And I'll talk some more about mutations in the virus a little bit later on. Another thing to bear in mind is that the population of over 70s is also quite different. So Australia has more people in the over 70 group than Ireland. So you'd expect the number of deaths to actually be less as a result of that. And the flip side is that in Italy and Japan, the figures as of today show that there's a large number of people who are over 70, roughly 18% in Japan and 16% in Italy. So that's probably contributing to what's actually happening overall there. If you take just total cases per million, and if you take the data from today, you find it's actually fairly evenly spread across the British Isles, Ireland, and through France and most parts of Scandinavia. There are, of course, hotspots in Italy and Spain, which are well documented, but the actual per million distribution is very, very even. And that tells us there's a consistent pattern of disease spread happening around the world. And that's probably as you would expect. So the big story, I think, with Ireland is the mode of spread. So these were the figures uh, as of two days ago, where basically half the group shown here in red are the ones which are the community-based transmission. And then there's one quarter close contact and one quarter travel abroad. That's completely different from Australia, where about 97% of our cases came from travel abroad. And that's made them a lot easier to actually contact trace and work out where they are and who they've spent time with which is probably one reason why we've done a little, a little bit better. So a couple of things that we know about risk to healthcare workers and why it's a good thing, the dental practices are mostly closed up at the moment. We know this virus is in large amounts in the nasopharynx and the saliva. It's easily aerosolized and it will certainly hang around for about one and a half hours in the air. It's highly contagious and it'll go right through a regular surgical mask. Doesn't provide much of a significant barrier at all for most brands, not all, but for most. And when we look at the people who have got sick and died during SARS and during coronavirus in China, there's a disproportionately high number of healthcare workers who are working close to the face of people. ENTs, maxillofacial surgeons, people working in dentistry and ophthalmology. And that tells us it's a good thing that we're not actually actively at work particularly if we're 60 or above, because we would be in a risk group. So if someone's going to get coronavirus, as you know, the symptoms would be cough, shortness of breath, fever, and so on. But we now know there are often two earlier symptoms that come along before. One of them is diarrhea, and the other one is loss of a sense of smell, which is now being regarded as one of the sort of signal signs to look out for. So if you have had an exposure at work or in the community and you're wondering about what's going on, then those two symptoms could be quite meaningful. Of course, there are other conditions which will cause both of those. So they're not pathonomic in that regard. I want to talk a little bit about if you then go home and you don't do anything or touch anyone for 14 days, are you off the hook, so to speak? The answer is actually not. It's a statistical probability that most people who are going to get unwell are going to get unwell within 14 days. But just over 100 people out of 10,000 will go on to develop symptoms after a COVID exposure outside of the 14 day period. So if you have been through an isolation or quarantine exposure, or one of your friends or family members have, don't get too excited about getting to the 14th day because there might be still something lurking for you on the other side. Now I want to talk a little bit about how many people one individual person infects. This is often described as the R naught figure. So with influenza, a normal person would infect about 1.3 people on average. With COVID-19, the stated average figure is 2.5, but it can actually be as high as six people. And I'll show you some recent data from China on that in a moment. The incubation period is longer, which means you're not sure you've got it. And so you're walking around with a high viral load, 
unlike influenza, where the incubation period is much shorter, only a couple of days. And as we've already mentioned, the hospitalization rate is about tenfold higher and the mortality is much, much greater. So I thought I'd just give you a comparison in terms of R naught figures for some other conditions that you might know about. So if you look at, for example, a very contagious condition like measles, measles typically infects about 12 to 18 other people, incredibly contagious. So when you've got something which is lurking around about you know, three, four, five other people, that's actually quite a contagious condition that one would be concerned about. So here is the most recent data from China on the R naught figure. And this is plotted against different days in January. And while most of the measurements show that it's sitting around about two and a half, which is the stated average figure, I want you to notice there's a couple of outliers up here that are sitting at about six and a half. So if the six and a half figure is correct, then one person infects six people. Then those six people all infect another six people. So basically one person gives you 38 people with only one cycle of the whole thing going through. So you can see why it balloons very, very quickly. That's why, as I said, in Ireland, you've got 506 healthcare workers at the moment. And I hope that none of those people end up succumbing to the virus. That would be very sad. But I can tell you that in Italy, a lot of healthcare workers have died from COVID-19 infection, unfortunately. So now I want to talk a bit about the viral load in the person who's infected. This is really important if you are going to work in an emergency service. And as the pandemic passes, we'll have to step right back through all this pandemic restrictions and start to get back to a normal world. So understanding viral shedding is actually really important for that principle. So first of all, not surprisingly, when people are symptomatic, they have a high, high viral load. But by how much? About 60 fold higher, which is a very large amount. And people who've had a severe illness will shed virus for a lot longer. I'll give you some figures on shedding in the respiratory tract as well as shedding in the GI tract a little bit later on. When someone has a mild case, they're not viremic for as long and they don't shed for quite as long, which is a very good thing. So looking into the shedding pattern, there's no point telling you what the average shedding period is because the average is the average. Half the people shed more and half shed less. So I'm gonna more focus on what do 99% people tell us? So what is that outlier at the end, basically? Unfortunately, we don't have really good big data sets on that because not so many people have started to look at shedding in large cohorts. And that's one of the great gaps in knowledge we have at the moment, unfortunately. So what do we know? So we know that respiratory shedding can happen up for about three weeks, 21, 22 days is not unusual. And this is even with mild infections in children who generally don't get a severe form of the disease. We know that from some studies in Singapore where patients are managed very stringently, that people shed for about 24 days. So we think that somewhere around three weeks is about normal in terms of shedding from the respiratory secretion. So that would be from sneezing, coughing, blowing your nose, and of course from saliva that we might aerosolize. When we look at fecal shedding, we know that children certainly shed in their feces for several weeks. We know that in some cases, the shedding goes on for more than a month, and that might lead to some secondary little mini outbreaks due to poor hand hygiene involved in toileting. So that's a little aspect that hasn't had too much airplay so far that I suspect might become more important in the coming months. Good hand hygiene solves a lot of problems. That's why it's really important that people think about and understand this particular point. And that then naturally leads on to how long does the virus survive on a surface? So previously people made estimates based on SARS or MERS, but this is a slightly different virus. So now we have actual data from the NIH on how long the virus survives on surfaces, like plastic or stainless steel or cardboard. And the answer is it survives for a surprisingly long time, certainly for 74 odd hours, 72, 74 hours, if it's on a typical hard surface. And this means that when aerosols settle onto a surface, someone who contacts that surface can then pick up the virus by contact transmission. And that's a problem. And that of course is the whole rationale behind social distancing, trying to keep out of someone's breathing zone, trying to stay away from potential coughs and from sneezes. And coughs and sneezes generally propel particles about 1.5 meters. So if you're two meters away, those particles aren't going to directly hit you. You're also outside the breathing zone of the person. And this is why social distancing is so effective and so important to do. 
as well as, of course, keeping your distance, it makes sense to avoid people who are unwell. So all of the pandemic plans around the world try to limit the treatment provided to people who are actively infectious and to do that in rooms that are specially set up. So in a few minutes time, I'll talk about negative pressure environments and why that's such an important thing to do. It may not be that difficult to do depending on the facility where you currently work. But of course, what we're all doing now is staying at home while we're getting all the emergencies set up and developing a system to appropriately triage those people. The Irish government has some great information on their website and they've certainly pushed the stay at home message very, very strongly. They've done the same thing in Australia, but they haven't used the lockdown word because that would probably just create more panic buying at supermarkets and we'd be, have even less toilet paper in canned food than we already have now. So I think they're just trying to avoid a bit of a, a social infodemic. What I think is good is the Irish government has actually put a couple of uh, platform or ceiling dates in there. And one of those, of course, is the 12th of April. Basically, you know, bunker down for a couple of weeks and we'll view it and see how it goes. So if that trend starts to plateau down, as I hope it does, then you might find that some of those restrictions might be eased up just a little bit. And that would be my fervent hope for the Irish people. So now I want to talk about how effective is social distancing. We've had some episodes in Australia where people haven't done any social distancing at all. They've gone to a very popular beach and they've all sat around in their thousands. That's not very smart. So when you do that sort of behavior, you get a huge spike in cases. When you social distance, you lower the height of the curve and therefore you don't overwhelm your medical services. My concern is about a second wave, which could be from a mutated virus or from fecal oral spread into the community, much like norovirus outbreaks that you see on cruise boats, for example. We don't know much about so-called second wave infections yet. It's probably still too early. But I just keep that in the back of your mind because that could influence how we do dentistry in the future, I would suspect. So onto virus mutation. We know from genetic mapping the virus that it does mutate. Its close relatives, which are the bat coronaviruses on the left and the right, they also mutate. But by studying lots of the genomic variation in the human COVID-19, we know it has been mutating. It's been doing that in China and it's been doing it in Europe. In fact, if you take the mutation information, you can actually track where the virus goes. And this has allowed investigators to work out that the infection in Italy actually began from people in China who traveled to Italy because of the unique genetic fingerprint of that specific strain of the virus. In the US, many strains of the virus are being identified by sequencing. So we're starting to get a better picture of how often the virus is changing. But the problem is with any virus that changes often, you have the risk of developing a quasi species that is no longer protected by the type of herd immunity that develops after an outbreak. And this is exactly the pattern that we've seen with influenza outbreaks in the past, which is a bit of a concern. So it is a rapidly mutating virus. We don't know if we'll get complete quasi species yet, but that's possible. I hope that doesn't happen. We do know from MERS that once people have a coronavirus infection, that generally they're protected for at least a few weeks, if not a bit longer from getting another one. But how much longer after that, no one actually knows because we simply haven't had people on the ground long enough. Remember the first cases only developed in the middle of December. So it's far too early to actually understand the long-term complications in terms of the immune response. So what we're trying to do now, of course, by keeping people at home and social distancing is just to flatten the curve. And that, of course, is exactly what Ireland's national plan is all about. I've read this document pretty carefully. I think it's a pretty well put together plan, actually. It's quite comprehensive. And what Ireland is basically doing now is recognizing that there is some broad community spread. So it's starting to move from the delay phase, where you've got a somewhat contained situation, to a phase of more mitigation. And if you look at any of the current spread maps in real time, you can see all the little infections basically dotting themselves all the way across the counties of Ireland at the moment. So it's pretty clear that the mitigation phase is going to be the next one that Ireland is going to go through. At least that would seem to be the data from the way I'm looking at it. And that's why it makes sense that there has been a closure of dental practices because it would be very easy to spread this virus to dental staff and to dental patients by working normally in dentistry and generating aerosols. So I think the, the close down hurts people financially. I understand that absolutely, but it's about actually saving people's lives at the end of the day. So a couple of comments about then who unfortunately doesn't do well if they're infected. 
So here is the Irish data, current as of a couple of days ago, showing you the 65s and over do not do well. They're much more likely to be hospitalized. So people who were working in dentistry, hopefully did not pick up an occupational transmission before they shut down their practice recently, because they could probably expect to do fairly poorly if they were hospitalized. If you want to read up, there's some really good recent papers in the New England Journal of Medicine and the Lancet on the risk group. So I just want to summarize what they basically say. First of all, 65 years and above is definitely a risk group. 85 years and above is an exceptionally high risk group. We knew that from studies in China. Now there are studies in the US, and of course now there are studies from Italy and also Spain. So there's some pretty good numbers which we can rely on. The issue that this of course drives is then ventilators. And I think many people in the community, indeed even some people who work in dentistry, don't really understand that a ventilator does not treat an infection. It just supports someone being able to be breathed and oxygenated while their immune system fights off the infection. But once the lungs fill with fluid, the available surface area for oxygen transfer is very, very small. So there's a point at which you can support a patient, but a ventilator doesn't cure a viral infection. It doesn't cure a bacterial infection. And many people in Italy who died of COVID-19 had both bacterial infections in their lungs as a pneumonia, as well as a COVID infection in their lungs. So it's not just an exclusive infection. You can get two things at once, of course. So on to sort of some relativities about deaths. So a condition that people often compare serious conditions to are things like bubonic plague or Ebola where you're almost 50% likely to die if you, if you get the actual condition. So how does that stack up against COVID-19? I'm gonna show the data for China, then I'm gonna show the data for all the other major countries where there's been outbreaks. So here is the Chinese data. So if people who are over 60, they have an 18% case fatality rate, and that's not very good, so over 80. The people who are over 70, but less than 80, run at just under 10%, and the 60s and above run at about 5%. So that's much higher than the generally stated 3% that you'll find from the WHO. Then the colored graph down the bottom shows you the figures for South Korea in blue, China in red, Spain in yellow, and Italy in green. And you can see that they basically track exactly the same trend over there. So the people who are the over 70s and 80s are particularly at risk. So it's very important if you're in that group that you interact as little as you can with other people, and if you have friends and relatives in that group that you do not visit them except by video conferencing or by ringing them up on the telephone, these people need to be kept isolated for their own protection. That's very, very important. Now, moving on to talk a little bit about the situation in Ireland in terms of how quickly it's doubling. So on this website here, the exponential of the growth allows you to calculate the doubling ratio. So Australia is running at about every five days we're doubling and Ireland is running it every three days at the moment. So you're on a much steeper gradient of, of increase. So just to explain that to you, this graph has a logarithmic scale on the vertical and it has time since five cases have died on the horizontal. And there's a trajectory for each individual country, China, Iran, Italy, Spain, France, etc. So here's Ireland tucked away down over here in the lower left-hand corner. And basically, if you smooth it out, it's almost a perfectly straight line, which means that the current function is an exponential growth. And that will basically double roughly every two to three days. You can see that from the gradient of these lines. What you want to try to do is to pull this curve across, which reduces the rate of increase. Hopefully what we've done in Australia has got us to that point and hopefully we'll be able to drop this curve even further. But I guess only time will tell. So one of the big issues that we're going to face in the next little while, well, one of them is going to be perhaps a shortage of PPE in our major hospitals. I know a number of dental practices during the COVID epidemic have actually hoarded away lots of masks and P2N95 respirators. If you're one of those people, you might want to think about giving them to frontline healthcare workers because they're starting to run into shortages. That's just a suggestion for the common good of the community where you live and hope to work. Now I wanna talk about air conditioning systems and how the aerosol gets spread around your practice. So if you do decide to see some emergency patients and you are doing anything which generates aerosol, where will it go and why is that important? So summarized here are the things that generate aerosol. Ultrasonic scalers, high-speed handpieces, low speeds with red bands, 
particle beam devices, triple X's and lasers that have a water mist spray. Nothing new there. But I want to talk a bit about what happens to the aerosolized particles once they're created. There's only really three things that can happen. Basically, they can settle out onto a surface if everyone was to leave the room. They can be inhaled by the staff and the patients and therefore translocated to a different place or they can be trapped in the filters of the air conditioning system. There's really only three things that can basically happen to them over there. So you're sitting in this room, if you're wearing a mask, remember the aerosol is gonna hang around for roughly an hour and a half, then that mask is not gonna provide you suitable protection because the virus's size is around the most penetrating particle size for the mask, which is around about 0.1 to 0.3 microns. So that's your first problem. And we also know that people in practice have had a shortage of masks, so they're wearing masks for longer. And that creates a second problem, and that is the mask stops filtering everything. And this is best shown in this study, which looks at the amount of bacteria, big particles, that a mask can filter. So without a mask, there's about a million particles. And after 30 minutes, about 90% of those particles are still being filtered. But once you get to an hour, that drops, one and a half hours, Remember, this is a logarithmic scale. So by the time you get to two hours, you're down to only about 10 or 15% of useful function in the mask. So wearing a mask for a long period of time, certainly more than two hours is actually just crazy because you don't have any protection from anything that you're breathing in. You've basically dampened the mask from the inside and from the outside. Just a couple of quick comments about the N and the P2. The P2 comes from the EN, distribution, whereas the other, the N, comes from the American stand. That's why you'll often see the two things referred to simultaneously. So N95 is the same as a filtering face piece 2, just abbreviated to a P2. Be very careful, though, if you're sourcing masks that you don't buy particle masks designed for farmers, people cutting concrete, people doing electric arc welding. In other words, industrial masks, because there are N95 industrial masks these don't have splash protection, so they're not actually suitable for use in a healthcare setting. Don't be fooled and buy those masks at greatly inflated prices. Just for your reference, here is a table that compares the face filtering score and the N score, the American and the European, just for a point of comparison. So now a couple of quick words about air conditioning. So if you have a split system, for example, that moves fluid between an evaporator in the surgery and a heat exchanger on the outside. But the air basically moves around the room. So unless you put some sort of exhaust fan in the surgery, you can't create a negative pressure environment. If you put in something like a bathroom exhaust fan, for example, and you remove the large amount of air, then you could get a negative pressure environment. But there's no easy modification to a split system that you can actually do. In contrast, if you've got a central air conditioning system, then you might be able to do something. So a split system is pretty easy. You've only got two parts. In a built-in system, you'll have a large air handling unit that then will be ducted to deliver air through vents on the wall or up in the ceiling. So these are often called diffusers. Some of these diffusers are adjustable, much like the air conditioning vents in your car, where you can actually twist them in order to reduce the amount of flow. Make sure that you don't confuse where the air is drawn into with where the air is produced. I know it's a fairly simple mistake and people often make it. So how can you understand which is what? Well, very simply, you get some tissue paper or A4 paper and you put it over the air intake, what's called the return air. It generally looks like a type of grill, like a type of mesh. So the air is being drawn in, so the paper will be sucked up against the grill. So that's what you want. You want that intake to be in the operatory. So it's actively removing air from the operatory as you're working then you need to basically tailor down the amount of air that's being delivered. So what you do is you look up at the ceiling, find the appropriate bit, get up on a step ladder, and then basically look for the adjusting handle and adjust that so that you can reduce the flow by changing the position of the baffles. It's a reasonably simple thing to do. If you have both the air outlet and the air return in the same room, you only need to adjust it partially closed and voila, you've now got negative pressure. That means that air is coming into the room and you won't have anything which is in the air escaping out into the corridors, into other parts of the practice. So that's what negative pressure means. It means that the general movement of air is coming in. If you put the door very close to being shut, the door will 
close and you'll see and feel the changes as a result of the air moving around. You don't need to have sophisticated things to measure the air velocity or the air volume. You don't need those things. This is just a simple adjustment you can actually make by yourself. So look up at the ceiling and see whether your air outlets are adjustable. And if they are, you might be able to do something just like this. Um, just moving on, in China, this sort of arrangement has been used in, in isolation clinics where they've set up these clinics where the staff come in from one side, the patients come in from the other. They don't mix except for the actual treatment. This is designed to stop any contamination of obviously occurring between both of those different sort of groups. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of uh, very quick things about some myths that need to be busted uh, because some people might have been taken in by these. So zinc doesn't really work. Using a hairdryer up your nose doesn't really work. Taking chloroquine might be useful to clean your fishing tank, your aquarium at home, but don't take that for coronavirus because if you take the wrong form, it can actually kill you. But most importantly, ibuprofen versus paracetamol. Most of us have got these things in the practice and we almost certainly have them at home in our medicine cupboard. If you develop a fever and you're not an elderly person and you've got COVID-19, don't take ibuprofen because it will make the illness run for longer. You're not really working on the inflammation. It's a different process. It's not a primarily prostaglandin driven process. It's more of a cytokine storm. So it doesn't actually work, but it does give you some more complications. There's been a couple of recent papers in the British Medical Journal on that. So please don't do that. If you go to the Oxford site for evidence-based medicine, they basically say, if you're a younger patient, just let the fever run its natural course. If you're an older patient though, and the physiological burden of having a fever is a problem because of greater respiration rate and things like that, then use Panadol, don't take ibuprofen. So that's an important one to be aware of just for your own health and the health of those who you might know. And then finally, just a quick little comment at the very end about the rapid testing. There are some rapid testing kits. These look at either droplets of blood or some, in some cases they look at uh, either sputum or saliva samples. If they're using an antibody-based method, they're only picking up the response of the patient to the infection. They're not actually measuring the virus, which means you're looking at a delayed process. You're looking at people who've had the infection, who may have partially cleared the infection. It doesn't tell you where they're currently infectious. So it's not a test for viral load. The viral load test is a molecular test. It takes longer. So these quick five-minute or 10-minute tests are great for doing gross screening, but they don't give you an absolute yes or no indication. So just be a little bit cautious about getting too excited about those things. And very, very at last point I'd like to just inform uh, the, the uh, viewers about is there is a whole number of different vaccines that are now in their clinical trials. Some of these were developed uh, at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, where I live. A number have been developed uh, by Big Pharma in the US and Europe. In fact, there's been a big global effort to develop not one, but actually multiple different sorts of vaccines. If you want to find out more about vaccines, then there's a really good website, which the US government hosts called clinicaltrials.gov. And it lists many of the clinical trials for antiviral drugs, as well as for vaccines around the world. So that information will obviously change almost by the day. So if you want to keep an eye on what's happening in that space, don't wait to hear it from the news media, actually find it yourself on those public databases. So it's probably enough, enough talking from me and probably good to, to go back and uh, get some questions and also to hear from our other presenters. Thanks very much, Anne. Yeah. Well, um, Professor Lloyd, that was, again, that was absolutely excellent. I mean, you've gone through a huge amount of information there. Um, I think um, everybody will learn quite a bit. Um, I suppose, uh, I think it's great to clarify about the mask. And I, I do know from forums that I'm on that people have bought masks in builder suppliers and places <laughs> yeah. so obviously absolutely <laughs> keep yep. those for your weekend welding yeah okay <laughs> that's right um and um the um i think the 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 other issue which you brought up at the last and the other one as well the hand hygiene and the oral fecal route mm. um i think that's another that's a that's something that probably as professionals we can spread you know help uh, spread that word in the next couple of weeks as well um absolutely. yep Absolutely, yeah, and absolutely. I think that's, you know, that's something I, I think a lot of dentists feel paralyzed at the moment, you know, can they do anything to help? And that's probably something that, that could be a, an area that we have. 
I think the other one you interesting where you talk about the ventilators um, and bacterial infection because again probably a lot of older people may actually have um, high bacterial loads in their mouth before they're ventilated. So that right. might be something here yeah. even going forward that yeah. we need to say to the IC unit, ICU units or yeah. Um, and um, I know uh, um, the um, you, you talked about the test. I know actually that Abbott have actually developed a 15 minute test, which is actually based on swab. It's actually mm -hmm. a so uh, they 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 look they fast track that in the US. I mean, that might be a more accurate test for mm -hmm. all of us in maybe in eight eight twelve weeks. Hopefully, yes. Yeah, um, so and I know I spoke to you earlier, and you talked about you know that you've set up. Um, uh, video conferencing to keep in contact with your high risk patients. Mm. And I think, you know, as, pay, as, as dentists, that's something that we all need to look at um, to, keep our, to keep our patient cool, you know, even not just our high risk, but maybe, as you say there, I mean, we could, we could most of us have a, um, a large family base. So we could educate mothers in the next, in the coming weeks about hygiene um, and keep, 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 keep keep their oral health in check by video conference. Yes, it's actually highly successful. We, we published a series of papers on this, which in a study we did with uh, 1,005 families in a low socioeconomic area that had the worst rate of caries in all of Australia. And we did an intervention where we compared what happens if you actually go into somebody's house than if you simply follow up with a directed telephone or sort of telemedicine type, type consultation. And yes. the difference, difference between the two in efficacy was only about 20%, but the, uh, the leading measure reduced caries by about 75%. And the, the telemedicine intervention reduced caries by about 45%. So we then did a cost benefit study, which we published in the British Medical Journal. And it saved uh, a health service. It was a, we did the figures in British pounds sterling because it was the, the journal was obviously after that figure, but it was an enormous amount of money. So that was then developed as a model of care. So we know that, strange as it may seem that talking to someone on the phone or in a video conference actually is a really good way of getting personalized information out and it does actually work it's right. really quite well, surprising yes yeah and i think people now you know if there's one thing that will come out of this is, is people will change the way they do things i think you know um six months ago if we had said to people look we're going to do a, a video conference with you they would have you know whereas <laughs> now yes people will be you know and actually, you know, people at home with children, this is an ideal time. They're home educating and they're looking for something to occupy the children. That's you right. know, this is possibly a time that we could actually um, really, um, you know, get their attention. That's right. And once we, once we start that process, then it's always easier. The habit is, you know, it's, it's easier to continue that. So I think this is going to change things uh, quite a bit. Mm. Um, and um, I suppose then the other thing too is, you know, a lot of us have patients in, in mid treatment, um, and at some stage, obviously, as you said, you know we're obviously going to reach a plateau, and uh, the restrictions will be will be changed slightly. How do you see us, you know, kind of gradually getting back into work? So the phase back process is almost exactly the reverse of the increasing restrictions that we've been through. So it'll be basically you know, looking at the patients who've got the emergency needs, the urgent needs, and then the conditions that don't require. Uh, instant care and then basically back to normal. So it'll basically phase back in through a series of steps. It won't go suddenly from a very high restriction to nothing. I wouldn't nothing have yet. thought. Yeah, so that also is good because it takes a while to get the dental suppliers back on board, get the dental labs up and running. There's a lot of machinery behind the scenes that has yes. got to be fixed. So you can't just turn a switch and say suddenly tomorrow, let's just go with a full appointment book because that would just be a disaster. You so, need yes. to have a, yeah. you know, a gradated sort of start up really. Yeah. Right. Okay. And on the negative pressure uh, pressure rooms, do you, obviously that's probably going to become the standard of care. Do you think, or the standard of operation? Um, it it might require a bit of a rethink. At the moment, there's no sort of pressure from the international standards level to make that a mandatory requirement. But you know, during our lives, we'll certainly have more pandemics. So it's something that yes. might be thought about if people are redesigning a dental practice. It might be worth rethinking that issue, which generally people don't think too much about. So, yes. Yep. Right. Good. Okay. Okay. And I think you said you'd share the documents on how uh, there, may, there obviously there are some clinics that may already 
fit the criteria and obviously those are the ones then that should be used for the emergency. I would have said so, yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, okay. Good. Um, and um, um, I think that's, um, uh, Emmanuel, have you any questions there or? No, I think that was a, um, a well-informed presentation, definitely. A little uh, daunting as well. I mean, there's a lot of reality there. I think we don't, as, uh, as a lot of uh, humans, don't like to hear reality. And, and I think how I see that is, um, it's more about preparation. So we, we are preparing as to see, like by knowing fully, being fully informed and knowing what's to come, we're better prepared in, in, the, in the sense of how to tackle this. And it seems like we're gonna be in it for a bit of a long haul and we are yet to see uh, its full potential at this stage. So, um, so I think the message here is that our governments perhaps need to be a little bit more stringent in really locking down movement um, and we certainly have to, uh, yeah, let's just see what happens. When we're in here. <laughs> but it, it yes. looks like we're potentially going to be in there, in here for about three or four months at the best possible scenario and six months, perhaps the worst, maybe even maybe a little bit longer. Um, but I, my concern here, Laurie, and everyone else who's watching, is the ramification of the whole dental industry after this, you know? Obviously, the economy is gonna be destroyed in many respects, but how long will it be, do you think, before we start seeing some back to normality in, in the dental profession? Yeah, I guess the really good thing about this uh, pandemic, if you can call it that, is that, that there's you know 195 countries affected. This isn't like um, a single episode, like a volcano going off or a, you know, a large plane crash, something that affects just one country. This affects everybody equally. And that means that effectively everyone is in the same boat. And therefore, you're more likely to see uh, a lot more cooperation and coordination versus a situation where the rest of the world is perfectly okay and one country is in a fair bit of bother. So I think that's actually a good thing in a way. Um, not that it should be, you know, the shy and proud of, you know, enjoying other people's misery, but it's actually like a shared joint purpose and the world's been through these things after depression after world wars so this is another one of those events that things will grow stronger from and i think for dentistry it will do things like this idea of doing some video conference consultations which before people couldn't see the need now that there is a need and there's a possibility to do it this sort of stuff once you've done it you won't go back so i think it will fundamentally change the landscape for a number of things so i think we just need to be prepared for some of that change which is going to happen and basically this will drive some really good changes i think so we're looking at a italy and spain at the moment whereas italy is entering to about a hundred thousand infected people mm. where do you think their peak will reach that's very difficult because uh, at the moment southern italy has been largely unaffected so sicily and those sorts of areas and i think when the virus starts to spread through there we're going to see um, quite a significant um, outbreak there. Um, people have argued that perhaps because they're warmer climates, it won't do quite as well. But the data on climates aren't that strong. We certainly know the virus has done well in Indonesia and many quite hot, humid places. So I don't think the warmer southern Italian climates are necessarily going to stop the virus from spreading. So um, I don't know. I think the big problem with Italy is just the age demographic, as I showed you. Um, it's just simply a very large number of people who are over 70. So they just don't do well, unfortunately. Last so I suspect it's going to get um, it's going to get fairly grim, unfortunately. Really. Mm. Well, the last question I have then, sorry, um, is this vaccine? How long or how real will it be before we see a working vaccine? So the problem isn't so much um, the mass production; it's actually the regulatory approval. So what this pandemic has done is it forced uh, FDA in the US, TGA in Australia. Um, various other similar bodies around the world to really rethink about what they have because their current approvals process involves many, many months of trials and lots of data. And there needs to be a real slickening of this sort of fast tracking process because it simply just increases the body count when it takes longer. So I think we will see some accelerated approval processes for vaccines that will come out of this pandemic as one of the learning experiences for the world. I think that'll be a very good thing. It's certainly sorely needed. But what do you think is an average, perhaps, of getting a working vaccine, do you think, realistically? 
Well, I think of the uh, current vaccines, I think there's probably five that are quite strong candidates, um, looking at them from an immunology point of view. Um, it will be a question of the, the regulatory approval. So I would say uh, four to six months would be a, probably a, a likely window if it goes very well and fairly smoothly. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, um, I also think, Emmanuel, you know, at the end of the day, um, dentistry is part of healthcare. The mouth is the gateway to the body. You know, we need, we, unless we're going to decide to uh, completely um, <laughs> ignore uh, dental health, dentistry has to get back working. Well, I guess, stage, I, you know, when it's safe. I guess from um, this is as Professor Laurie Walsh is such a lateral thinker and it has a very good way of putting things into sort of the balance here. Where does the risk in treating patients outweigh the benefits, Laurie? So um, when we're setting up the emergency clinics this week, there are a whole range of things that will clearly be an urgent event for a patient. A you know, infection that's causing you know, airway compression would be a really good example. And there are, there are dental serious infections like cavernous sinus thrombosis or Ludwig's angina, which have got reasonably high fatality rates if they're not treated. And we have seen patients die of these things. So those things need to be treated. And that's why it's great in Australia, we've had some wonderful cooperation from the maxillofacial surgeons who have really come on board to help us form some squads to manage those things. You know, other dental conditions that aren't quite as serious, often we can reduce the symptom severity of, but once you've got infections that are spreading, and these are often in the most socially disadvantaged people, these can be a big problem. And unfortunately, it's going to be an issue when you've got most of your dental services shut down, how these people are going to get access to care. So all of the uh, public health units need to plan very carefully where they're going to locate their emergency facilities because we will need them. You cannot turn everything off, otherwise there will be people who'll have adverse outcomes and who will die. Even in a, a high income country, people still die of dental infections in remote areas. So we can't stop everything. All right. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, uh, Anne, if you've got any last questions, we could probably get- Well, no, I would again, just say, I think that was excellent. And I think a lot of food for thought there. And um, as you say, Emmanuel, quite sobering, um, but um, you know, we are where we are and we've got to deal with it now. Yeah, yes. that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Anne. thank you. Okay, so I'll let you continue on and you've got... Yes, Eamon. so um, Eamon, obviously after um, all of that, it's, it's uh, hard to talk about the, the finances of a, <clears throat> of a practice, but um, I suppose at this stage, maybe even just you've got a really comprehensive document, um, but um, I suppose at this stage, your advice to, to, to dentists? Simple advice, what's your, you know, uh, get professional advice or? Um, oh, Eamon is oh, muted. Yeah. Thanks, Anne. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Eamon Corrigan. I run a practice in Northern Ireland, uh, Corrigan and Co Limited. Um, we are in Northern Ireland, which is uh, owned by UK tax law and I'm about 10 miles from the border of Ireland, so I'm well placed to understand the the things that are in place in Ireland as well, because I've clients all over the island. Uh, there has been some announcements for businesses and individuals over the last couple of weeks with a lot of pressure put on the various governments. Uh, if it's okay, Anne, I'll, I'll list out a couple of major right, okay. for, for dentists who would be interested in the main one in UK and Northern Ireland is the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme. This basically is where uh, employees are furloughed, which is a, a new word to me. I had to look it up in the dictionary. Basically, it's granted leave of absence from work. Your employees are not supposed to do any work, but uh, for dentists, the employees, uh, the, the dentists I work with, they're they're doing a lot of training at home. Uh, obviously, it's something as you know we never have time for in dental practices. Uh, the principals are taking advantage of doing some marketing and maybe updating their websites, etc. The main thing about the the job retention scheme is uh, it's a grant to cover eighty percent of wages of retained workers. 
Uh, it's initially open for three months and backdated to the 1st of March. HMRC are putting this in place now and hope to have the first grants out no later than the end of April. The second thing which was recently announced uh, over the last couple of days is a self-employed scheme, which basically is uh, will be eligible for principals and associates. Uh, not 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 uh, not uh, dentists who have incorporated. That's a separate issue. Uh, the client needs to be self-employed, either as an individual or a member of a partnership, and they need to be trading in the 1920 year. It'll, it'll be based on the average profits of the last three years, uh, up to a maximum of £50,000 of profits. And the maximum monthly grant, which will be taxable as well, is £2,500. Uh, Again, it's a taxable grant. It's on the 80% of the average profits. And how you apply is uh, the government will be contacting you and it will not be available to the end of June. So there's an awful lot of uh, talk about this and that people are making cases that there's a lot of people slipping through the net. And it's a work in progress at the moment. Uh, again, this, this is all UK based I'm talking about. Okay. The, the other small measures, well, they're not that small, hopefully. The next self-assessment tax payment will be deferred until January 2021. So anyone has tax to pay in July, don't pay it. it, it, it it's, you don't have to do anything, just don't pay it. The next VAT quarter, for those dentists who have a VAT return to do, which are very few, uh, those are being deferred for three months. Uh, there's also been announced a mortgage holiday. If you have a if you have a personal mortgage, uh, can be deferred for three months. The lenders need to be approached on this. Most of them are making an online portal available, so it's easy to do. Uh, one thing we've been doing last week is dental business has attracted small business rate relief, which is quite a few. Will get a grant funding from your local authority of ten thousand pounds. Those are due to be paid actually today, Monday. So I'm looking at my own bank account that hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, and also dentists know that will not have to pay rates for the next three months. There's nothing in other areas of the UK. Just That's just Northern Ireland. And the rollout of the new private sector IR35 scheme, which would have affected some associates, has been delayed until the 1st of April 2021. The other thing I've been urging dentists to do is check their insurance policies. Uh, dental businesses that cover get covered for pandemic and government order closure should now be covered. Please check with your insurance company. Uh, the did I mention the self-employed scheme? I'm yes, sure. you did. Yeah, I did. So that that's that's a work in progress at the moment. The other thing of note is. The filing deadline for a company accounts has been extended for three months. Uh, and the one thing I should mention now, I mentioned about dental and corporates, those who pay themselves a salary and dividends through their own company are not covered by the job retention scheme, but will be covered by the coronavirus job retention scheme with their operating POE scheme. So therefore, if a director's salary of say 30,000 They'll be able to get 80% uh, of that, plus employers' national insurance, plus uh, the auto enrollment pension. So uh, up to a maximum of 2,500 a month. So that's the only thing for directors at this stage. But there's a lot of uh, a lot of noise being made in various sectors. So that sort of covers the UK a bit. The things we've been doing for dentists at the moment has been checking if there's any R&D going on. There's a great grant going for it. Uh, checking that all the capital allowances has been exhausted. Uh, what else are we doing? We've been looking at residential property for dentists. We have investments in that. Looking at pension charges, carrying out inheritance tax reviews and make sure your wills are up to date, which is very important at this stage. I know it's a bit morbid, and uh, it's maybe a good time to incorporate dental businesses to save tax. Maybe consider bringing your spouse into your dental business. 
So that's really all the UK and Northern Ireland. And Anne, will I talk now about what's available in yes. your native in, country, Ireland? In, yes, yeah, do please. Uh, Ireland has been a wee bit slow off the mark on this one. Um, the, the main thing they have is a temporary wage subsidy of 70% to take home pay up to a maximum weekly tax-free amount of 410 euros, which basically is equivalent to 500 euros a week before tax. Uh, workers who've lost their jobs due to the crisis will receive an enhanced emergency COVID-19 unemployment payment of £350 a week. Uh, also for businesses, there is mostly financial supports, which are basically uh, loans made available through the Strategic Banking Corporation of Ireland Working Capital Scheme. And there's also a, a rescue and restructuring scheme. There is a microfinance Ireland loan increased from 25,000 to 50,000 euros. And also a very nice we want from local enterprise agencies. They're given in every county, providing vouchers of up to 2,500 euros for business supports, which covers, uh, just bear with me, Yes, Eamon, actually, I think that's um, a really good one. And a, a lot of dentists may not be aware of that because a lot of them may not have used their, their local enterprise board up to this, even yes. though they, they, the enterprise boards provide a great service. But that two and a half thousand, Eamon, is because I actually checked, I have applied for it, um, and it covers accounting, HR, um, uh, Mark, any advice that you know, any any yeah. uh, advisory body. Now, normally the uh, enterprise boards have their own um, advisors, but obviously they're going to well, a they're going to be uh, oh, swamped, and b the girl I spoke to said, well, look, if you've got somebody who, you know, knows your industry well, um, you know, you can make a case in your application to use that person. So, <clears throat> um. That you know, I know that you know you you've established yourself as a a dental um, accountant, so you probably be positioned to do uh, uh, reports for people. Yes, um, and get and use this use this 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 uh, voucher. That's right. So it's most of the stuff in in the south is uh, regarding uh, financial packages. Uh, one of the things it covers is uh, preparing a business case for the banks. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, if 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 if, if this two thousand five hundred could be used for that, it'd be very useful yes. for for that. Yeah. Uh, to put it, you know, to put a proper place because a lot of them don't want to incur a large um, consultancy fee themselves at this stage. That's right. Um, but if they could, if they could get help with it, um, and you know, um, as we said already, this is going to change the way we practice dentistry so maybe now is the time to think about you know efficiencies how you could make your because you, i know you've done a lot of work on making your practice more efficient and profitable so maybe this is the time for for dentists to sit down and look at how they work and how they price you know and that you know when eventually they get back to work that they'll actually be more efficient and make up uh, and be in a position to survive I think it's an ideal time to work on your business and not in it. So uh, yes. We have no uh, we have no choice at the moment. Don't, yes. So, um, any any work and I think this voucher could be very useful to to it's not costing you anything. So uh, I'm not uh, you know, I think it could be quite useful if it's used in the right way. Yes. Uh, other smaller things that's been taxation things that's been mentioned for this for for Republic of Ireland is interest on late payments is suspended for January, February, VAT, and both February and March POE. Uh, all debt enforcement activities suspended. Uh, uh, that's about a fair three months of loan repayments will be available to many businesses. Uh, a small but important change of many business contact credit card payments is up from 30 euros to 50 euros. So that's really the majority of the stuff that's around in the UK and Northern Ireland, Ireland. Uh, it's a moving feast at the moment and uh, I'm constantly updating my PDF as you made reference to earlier. Yes. And uh, that is available to everybody who wants to 
maybe Anne, you can share how yes. that Yes. Yeah. That's um, excellent. No, that was excellent, Eamon. I think that will uh, be provided very uh, useful information there and hopefully um, and people can, be, uh, anybody who's interested in getting in contact with you can do that. There is, the, 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 the thing I mentioned about the job retention scheme, there's, there's, there's a few procedures to follow on that and I have uh, a, 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 an agreement. You have to get all your employees to sign in order to use this for 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 low for law I think it's called it's a, it's a fancy word the the uk government's made it really complicated every, all of these measures and nothing's very very fast which is needed and uh, we have found there's a lot of businesses up in in a scale and where i'm from has closed the doors right. and uh, it, it just hasn't been urgent enough all this yes yes but we have to do what you know what's in front of us and yes. uh, we're doing our utmost to, to, to do our best for our clients. Okay, lovely. Okay, thanks, Eamon. Thank you, Anne. Yeah. Emmanuel? Yes, thank you very much, Eamon. It was uh, fantastic. Um, so, uh, thank you. Okay, yeah. um, uh, I will now remain here with Anne, Dr. Anne McDonnell, and we'll yes. close the session fairly soon. And, you will have the opportunity to ask any questions if you want from a um, business strategy point of view, what de dentists perhaps should be considering doing now down in this downtime. Um, you know, as Eamon pointed out, which is kind of a valid point is people should be working in their practice right now rather than, you know, uh, sorry, on their practice on. rather than yes. in on the practice. And this is a good time to actually start putting systems in place, restructuring mm -hmm. training, and get prepared when things slowly come back online. Yes. Uh, so are there any questions in relation to that as to perhaps you might have um, for the audience? Well, I know, uh, Emmanuel, you've got, I mean, the My Practice app has got, obviously, there's a lot of features in that. Um, and some of those, obviously, we wouldn't be using at the moment, but your, the feature with the video conferencing, uh, sure. where, you, where you send a text message, and that's, uh, that would obviously be very useful at the moment. And then just getting familiar with the rest of the package so that people are ready again to, you know, to, 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 and look at how they would use that to change their practice. Well, during this time, it's very important um, to the strategy here is to preserve the database. So what I mean by saying that is to actually try and maintain the clientele that you have in the in, uh, yes. in your database as active as possible. And is in, and the only way you really can do that is to try and be as engaging as possible remotely. So being there, communicating the stages and steps of what's happening in the business is very pertinent in stage. So you need delivery tools to be able to do that very efficiently, as well as be able to reach out and try and remotely access the, pay, the your patient base. So these are the two strategies that need to be active right now. So first of all, informing patients of your changes and things to be aware of in the clinic, as well as having an opportunity for patients to try and reach you if they're concerned um, and how to each reach you easily. So. This is what we integrated into the My Practice system to be able to help you with that a little bit. And so I can actually show just aspects of that. And I will just guide you to a little bit of where the, the website is. And, and I know, Emmanuel, you've always been preaching that um, dentists, you know, are so excited, are always looking at new patients and they don't look at their own patient, the, the, the base that they have or look after them properly. So I think this, again, it's, you know, this is the ideal time to start looking at, at you know, your base. That is your, that is the, what you need to really nurture. I, I, um, totally, I totally agree. I think, I think the focus, I'll just get out of the Zoom there uh, in the session. Um, I think the focus has been so much for a lot of practices, even in the past, is that they're kind of using a slightly wrong formula in building the practice. The formula that we that a lot of dental practices use or that a lot of dentists use is that they, they kind of have a, a patient base that they've developed through word of mouth and then they kick in the marketing and they really try and get as many new patients as possible to go through the practice. But there are other problems there that they should be focusing on. Uh, um, usually the outside strategy of getting uh, online patients and, and building the, pra the practice through online strategies such as uh, your website and 
and social media and all those things are very useful when you're trying to build a practice, right? Mm -hmm. but when you've got a well-established practice that's had a database, you should be really switching your marketing dollars towards the database and actually in, um, working internally to increase that word of mouth strategy. That's where things are far more cost effective. The problem is that with many practices that they lose focus of that internal database and they keep thinking that replenishing the database with new patients is the way to go. In fact, that's probably the most costly way. If you can reduce the number of patients, patients that you lose in your practice, as well as increase the word of mouth referrals and decrease cancellations, you essentially don't really need a lot of external market. But if you have lost control in those three sectors, that is, your database is shrinking because patients are leaving because there's no loyalty towards the practice. The word of mouth is not there and it's also shrinking and cancellations are high, then you really need to work very hard to get lots of new patients in the practice. Now, this is a self perpetuating formula that is a losing battle for many practices, especially if corporates get very close to those practices. They have a lot more dollars and a lot more influence on social media and online to spend to turn those patients away from the practice. So I don't really believe that the strategy here is to focus too much externally, especially if you've got a well-established practice, really focus on how you can create better value for your patients, get them a bit more secure in the practice, as well as really uh, use a lot of uh, word of mouth uh, strategy. In other words, um, invest more money in your database to make it work for you rather than go outside and try and get fresh new patients into the practice. Does that make yes, sense? Uh, yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah. It's fine. Um, and as you say, having um, reducing cancellations and having longer, more efficient appointments. Absolutely. And that's, the, that's the other problem is that the practices in many practices that we've dealt with, the practices run too fast. By running too fast, there's really some self-propagating problems in this. Running too fast means that you're going through the patients too quick. And by going through the patients too quick, you're not really do, providing comprehensive dentistry. So you're not spending time with patients is really going to create the relationships. The faster you go, you don't create those relationships. So there's really a couple of um, you know, self-perpetuating problems here. One is if you go too fast, you don't spend time, you don't develop the relationship. And secondly, you don't do the comprehensive dentistry that you need for um, ongoing work. For the practice so and for the patient um, so slowing down the practice and in slowing down your appointments and spending more time in comprehensively explaining things and going through a better examination with those patients when they come in really will be more beneficial for your practice in the long run mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes yeah Okay, so do you want to run, run us through some of the features of my practice? Just yeah, yeah, just very briefly. This is the website, um, you, uh, mypracticeapp.com. You log in and register. You're, you actually, there is a free plan here that you can take advantage of uh, while we're going through this period. This is our way of giving back to um, the dental community at the moment is that there are some free plans that you can use. And this is the My Video Consult and my survey and my phone leads. Now, the my video consult means that the way, I mean, we all have Zoom and, and, um, and Skype and all of these features, but what happens in this system is that we're able to deliver it as an SMS, very easy to deploy over the phone. So people who, especially elderly patients who really don't know technology very well, this system does it very nice in delivering the technology and they're able to um, connect very quickly as well as we have a booking feature that is plugged into this system as well. The My Campaigns is a feature that um, is here, but we are going to bring it into the free plan. The only thing is that you have to cover your SMSs on this. Um, otherwise, normally we would be charging for this um, service, but at the moment we won't. Um, just covering your SMSs, the emails we do cover, so you don't have to pay for the emails. But my strategy here would be two things. First of all, Create a nice video explaining to your patients the changes that are taking place in your practice, embed it into this system and then send it out as an email and as an SMS. And this, this way patients can um, get your video information rather than a text me uh, message or an email. So you're verbally explaining as, your as the dentist of the patients. 
the things that are happening within the practice. They'd like to hear from you. They'd like to see from you. And it's a point of connection as well. And then they're able to respond to you, whether they want to make an appointment, whether they want to connect with you, whether they want more information in, and they do this through the system. Then I would uh, follow that with a video consult. So you'd book in, you'd book your patients in for a video consult and you charge accordingly for the time that you uh, are doing those. There are some consults you can do over the uh, uh, video conferencing and uh, they're things that you perhaps should be looking at investing as a model into your practice. I mean, this is the new way of going. I think it, it, it has been there dormant for a long time. There could have been a potential for its use in the past, but certainly now moving forward, it is definitely going to be something that all practices are going to be instilling in their, in their model, uh, in their business model. So um, this is a great feature. Have a go at it. Have a try. There's some, lots of help. Uh, there's a, a Facebook forum where there's a, lots of training and help on how to even do an online consult as well. Um, that's pretty new for a lot of people. Um, and we're building this environment so that uh, dentists can more effectively communicate with their prospective patient base and not lose their patient base while we go through this uh, several months of ordeal. Yeah, no, that's excellent, Mario. I think, and that's a superb offer. I mean, we should get, I think people, people should take that up um, and at least, um, as you say, keep touch with, them, with, with patients and you know, let, let, and work from there. But yeah, superb, well done. Thank you. That's a, yeah. Um, You're so what do, so if somebody wants to take this up, what's the next step for them? Just sign up and uh, sign up. you'll have the free account and just keep using it, I guess, until, um, you know, you could decide that you might want to go up to another better plan that's there. But um, at the moment, as we said, we are making those devices, uh, those services free while we're going through this pandemic. Um, yes. Obviously, they cost us. The way we get covered is just to cover the SMSs at this stage. There are server costs that we have. It's very... Yes. And there's IT, the infrastructure that supports the whole system. Today, for example, in Australia, we overloaded the system, so it crashed a little. So we had to em employ more IT people to bring in the infrastructure. And during this time where people are cutting back and, you know, what we're finding here in Australia is that many dentists are getting laid off at the moment. Yes. Um, a lot of staff are getting laid off. Um, so while they're going through that ordeal, you know, our company is going through that ordeal as well. So it's a real fine balance trying to keep everything afloat. Yes. At the yes. It's really, yeah. really hard. Well, look, we all have to, we all have to um, work towards the day when this will, will end, which it will. And we have to, you know, we have to be as prepared for that as we can be. Everything has. And we have, to, as I say, we have to have a new way of working. So this is the time to get all that in place. Look, the, uh, Everything has an endpoint. Definitely, this this will have an endpoint. Um, we don't know how severe the ramification will be from this, but we know that it's not going to be easy after this. Things are going to be realigned. There are things that are going to be better. There are new things. There are going to definitely be new delivery. Like you know, the world has been lagging a little bit from the on, uh, on the online world. A lot of it has been adapted by the young people to really get in online and purchase things online and deliver mm -hmm. things online. And, and that's going to really propel a lot of people to move forward into the online world. And that's how I see there's a change there. So online is going to be really, really big, bigger than ever before. And I don't think that's going to change. It's just going to leap, push that forward uh, into the, in, in a different way. Communication online is also going to be extremely big and will re replace certain things that we took for granted in the past, like phone calls and coming into, oh, yes. into the office and making that travel there just to get a yes. consultation. I think the consultation, the consultation is going to propel itself online in a big way. So I think dentists need to be aware, as many other businesses, that this is where they should be and start to prepare yes. their business model. And it's it's also a far more cost-effective way of reaching people too um, and yes. engaging with people. So there's benefits in that. Um, there's also in their business model, they need to also look at perhaps some better payment plans and structures in, put, to put in place and think about mm -hmm. those because the ramifications from this, this virus and how people are going to you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we're going to go through a depression after this because yes. that's what happened in 1918. Soon after 
the flu, uh, Spanish flu, there was a depression. And that could be, you know, we, we are going to see a world recession out of this. So we have to prepare our business model around that the, the possibility of that is going to happen as well. So preparation and knowing how the virus behaves and knowing from past history what has happened is the best way to prepare uh, for the future and look at your business and very carefully and how to make it cost effective um, on an oily rag at the moment and, and look at your strategies very carefully um, as to uh, how you should be modeling your business into the future. Excellent, very good. So the website is my M -M -I. the yep. website, your website is mipracticeapp.com. Dot com, correct. Yeah. My, okay. my mipracticeapp.com. Excellent, okay. I really also okay. want to thank you, Dr. Anne McDonald, uh, for really having, um, you know, for really doing a lot for your community, the dental community, for, um, you know, organising this, um, uh, Professor Laurie Walsh, who for us in our, in our end of the world is a hugely respected individual, for having him on board with you and, and really sharing his knowledge to your dental community. I'm sure that there's a lot of information there that they would appreciate hearing um, from an expert of his calibre. Um, and I really want to thank you for um, bringing uh, Laurie to your table and to your audience and, and also bringing Eamon in for the um, accounting side and the business side uh, um, and helping a lot of dentists really understand what they should be doing from a financial and business strategy. I think it, you're doing such a great service to your community and I want to commend you for it. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Okay, well, will we uh, call it a... Uh, we call it a morning here and call it a night for you. Okay, lovely. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Eamon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Eamon. Thank you, Eamon.